All right, correct me if if I'm wrong, but we have cover and an or not at this point. Yeah, okay, so there's one more thing I want to show about that. And I'll be danged if I can remember the name of the logic law that I'm about to show you. It'll come to me as soon as I walk out of the class. But a way of simplifying logic. If you have this expression, say you figured out, you know, that one of the answers, you know, and then you have another answer here, whatever, right? There'd be something more complicated in figuring that out, right? It might be something like, you know, if input, you know, is equal to, you know, yes, then A is equal to true, or something like that, right? You know, you've made some decision. I did start it, and you are awesome. You get brownie points. Okay, so, right, you've come to some decision, right? Maybe, you know, B is... Heck, why don't I give my normal examples? Uh, you know, you are hungry, but you don't have money. Right. You can phrase things kind of like this. If A, my brain is glitching. If not A and not B, print, stay home. Now I'm not even sure that that logic is correct. Let's run it and couple, um, test it a few times. Because basically, I want it to only say that we can uh, go out to E if both of those are true. And I may have worded it wrong, right? That's the problem with throwing knots into your logic. The more knots you put into your logic, the more tangled it is. Okay, that's pretty cool. I'm going to patent that. I never said that before. Let's see if I got the logic right for this first set of input. I wanted to say stay home because they don't have any money. Or how about we just give us ourselves an error message. If not hungry and not money, we have no money, go out and eat. Okay, so I broke that one. That is bad logic. Let's do the other example that I usually get. Uh, sick is equal to false and tired is equal to false. So if not sick and not tired, colon, we're going to print go to work. Else we're going to print stay home. I have a more I'm more confident now that that's going to work. I what I did there. So, Since I wasn't sick or tired, I have to go to work. But I'm going to set one of those to chirp, right? Because I have a generous boss. He doesn't care if I'm tired. He says I can stay home. Okay. So this logic is, is chirp. We could simplify that. There's something called so-and-so's law, which I can remember, that says if you have this expression, not sick and not tired, you can rewrite it like this. If 
thought. If not sick or tired, in parentheses, colon, print, go work. Else print stay home. Why don't I just copy and paste those lines? It could be that that's easier for you to understand. The computer doesn't care how we write it, but maybe this logic is easier to understand. If I'm not sick or tired, go work. I'll stay home. Now, if you remember your, I forget whether it's called the distributive or associative property in math or something like that, but if you have something like this, you know, um, two or x is equal to 2a plus 2b. You can rewrite it. I don't care if y'all write, um, type this in or not. You can rewrite that as x is equal to 2 times, or 2a plus b. And we just have to remember that if we were trying to get these to actually work in a computer, rather than a math textbook, we'd have to put our asterisks there to send x there. Right, those are equivalent. Everybody good with that idea? Yeah, okay. Kind of the same thing, right? We took these knots and put them here. But unlike distributive, we had to switch the symbol, the uh, logic from and to or. And conceptually, I can't explain that, but it's the truth. If we tested out our output, you know, set both of them to uh, false, 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 and then we run it, it tells us to go work. If we set, you know, both of them to true, we've already tried one of them being true, then stay home, because we were sick and, and or tired. So, if that makes it easier to read, great. Could we rewrite this in such a way that it was still easier to read? I think so. What if we did this? If sick or tired, colon, print, parentheses, stay home, in parentheses, else colon, print, parentheses, go work. Now maybe you spot what I did. I flipped these, right? The else became go work rather than stay home. You know, and the stay home flipped to become go work. Well, how did that work? By removing the not, if I took not out of this equation and then flipped those, it becomes even easier to read. Why am I bothering to do that? Works the same way. If it makes sense to you to write it the other way, go for it. If it starts kind of hanging in your mind because we're using double negatives or something like that, then, uh, yeah, I would recommend going ahead and trying to simplify it. And when I'm talking about double negatives or whatever, I'm going to change the logic of this one up here a little bit. Try to get it right. friend to go eat. If that's not true, if you're hungry too, right, or you don't have any money, eh, we're, we're pretty cold and ruthless. Nah, he can starve. 
let's see if I got that right. Since I am hungry, but I don't have any money, I still don't think the logic is completely true, but I'm going to go ahead and simplify it anyways. So, I want to rephrase that using, I'm going to call it Bob's Law, because I really wish I could remember. See here, um, what did we say? We could put parentheses around that, but we would have to do one more thing to it. You know, who remembers? I'd have to change this part of it somehow. Yep, that becomes an or. What if it had been like this? If not hungry and not money. No, 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 no. I goofed. I'm going to forget it. If I can't do it, I'm not expecting y'all to do it. Just try to rewrite them so that they're clear. Right? If that's kind of difficult for your brain to understand, then that. Now here we're only dealing with two things. But we could conceivably go nuts, you know, you know, whatever. It starts getting really hard to understand. And the simpler you can make the logic, the better. One thing you can do to simplify things is to try to set up your if statement in advance. Like what if we have a temperature? You know, I'm going to do the same example. Uh, in Celsius, 100 degrees and up, or more than 100 is boiling and below zero is, is freezing at standard pressure. The uh, more you increase the air pressure, the harder it is to boil something. So anyway, so I'm going to say that the temperature is 73 degrees. And then I want to figure out whether to print frozen or, you know, liquid or boiling. And here's how I did it in the past. How about, uh, y'all don't even type this because I'm going to rearrange it, right? If T is greater than 100, then print, right, boiling. Else, you know, T is less than zero, print, freezing. Else, print. Liquid. Something like that. Now this example isn't uh, turning out as perfect as I wanted because that logic is too simple. But you could do things like this. Freezing is equal to temperature less than zero. And boiling is equal to temperature greater than 100. And then liquid is equal to not freezing and not boiling, right? Because if it's not freezing or it's not boiling. And then later on, if you needed to, you could do if freezing, right? Crank up the heat. If boiling, colon, print. Turn down the, the temperature. And then maybe if uh, liquid, we're just going to say, you know, perfect. Right, like that. Maybe this logic is easier to use. Maybe it makes more sense to you to see just if freezing, if boiling, and if liquid. Especially if these conditions are harder, right? Temperature less than zero, easy. But what if it had several components, right? Like this one has, you know, two components. Uh, a logical expression could have four components or eight components or whatever. This is called a flag. When you set a variable so that you can make a decision on it later, if you set a Boolean variable equal to true or false, you know, then uh, that's called a flag. It's called setting a flag, right? Something like this. If the number of items is equal to 100, but 
that's too many for us. Our logic is something like this. Uh, you know, limit error is equal to number less than zero or number greater than one, uh, 100, right? Either one of those cases is an error. And so later on, we could display, you know, if limit underscore error, then print, you know, oopsie, whatever we were supposed to do. Again, we evaluated some expression, and if it was the case, then we did something. That's called setting a flag. You can also do something like this. You could define three things, and some languages make this easier than others. I don't even remember how to set this the easy way in Python. It's called enumeration. But it looks like this. I'm going to say that freezing is equal to a 1, boiling is equal to a 2, and liquid is equal to a 3. And then I'm going to say state is equal to freezing for whatever. And I may change it later, right? You know, this could actually be a calculation. State is equal to, um, you know, temperatures less than zero, right? That sets, no, 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 that's not going to do it. If temperature is less than zero, colon, state, you know, is equal to freezing. Else, I'm just going to make it, if else the uh, state is equal to liquid. I'm skipping the boiling state, right? And then you could have your if statements down here. It could be much further down in the code, or it could be in a function or something like that. If state, like if we had a function that we wanted to do something with the state, right? We're passing in a variable. We're filling in a parameter called state. If the state is equal to freezing, colon, print, you know, heat. Got to heat it. That kind of thing. Else, if state is equal to boiling, print, cool. You got to cool it down. Else, you know, print, perfect, or whatever. It's Everything needs to, to stay the same. Just a second. Pardon? Isn't it supposed to be L instead of else? You are so good. I'm so lame. Everywhere I have used LIF. If that's the only one, okay, awesome. Sorry about that. Go from a Java class to a Python class. L lift. All right, so there we go. I'm going to actually tack it on like this. L if state is equal to liquid, print that it's perfect. But what if it doesn't equal any of those things? Else, print invalid state. Whenever you're enumerating a series of things like that with if, elif, elif, it's a real good idea to go ahead and tag on an else down at the bottom. This is the catch-all. This, this could check the problem. Well, what do I mean by that? What if somebody set state equal to an invalid value, right? What if, they, uh, initial, what if it was initialized to zero? And then it was supposed to be set later. State is equal to zero, right? I'm going to have to scroll up and down, and I'm sorry that I'm making it hard to read. Right. Right, that, right now, this is an invalid value. I, de I declared it, I initialized it with zero, and then later on, I was trying to set it to a valid value. And then later on, I called the check method, excuse me, the check method, function, and I was supposed to handle all of those states. Well, when we went in there, state was equal to zero, if it was supposed to say boiling, because my code is an error, right? I forgot to put something in that could check the state, set state equals boiling. And since I did that, it's still equal to zero when it gets into this function, when that function is called, and it wouldn't do any of these three things. We certainly shouldn't print perfect, which when it was just else, colon, Right, that was a problem. It said perfect. I'm going to undo that, and then I'm going to redo it. So if you're typing, don't make that change. Right, so if state was equal to zero, and that was gone, 
then, well, that was supposed to be a 1, that was supposed to be a 2. None of these checks would be true. And so, both of those would fail and it would print perfect. It's not perfect because we wanted it to equal one of these three states. We want to, to know, we definitely want to know that we have reached an invalid state, that that variable has been set to an invalid value. So strongly recommend always putting a dangling else to handle all the other conditions if you're doing something like that. Your logic could be wrong. I'm just going to type some pseudocode save time. But what if we had this? If grade greater than 90, then print A, right? L if grade is less than 90 and grade greater than 80. Now this isn't the great, greatest way to do it, but we're setting up an error condition. I'm intentionally putting errors in it. L if, or, and then finally else, you know, print fail. Right, there's our logic, kind of in pseudocode form. It wouldn't take me that much longer to, to fix it. But anyways, this is bad logic. They should have been greater than or equal to 90, right? Because what if the grade is exactly 90? Is 90 greater than 90? No. Not going to print that. Is 90 less than 90? Nope, it's not going to print that. So, their grade was equal to 90, and they fail. Uncool. What we should have done is enumerate all of these conditions. L if grade is less than 80, right? Print fail, and then put a final else in here to handle if none of the other conditions are true print right, grade not determined, error. We might put a reason why. But anyways, now we would spot that there was an error. Now if we uh, did what we usually do and, and set these things to easy you know, values, I'm going to set it to 100 and make sure it prints A, right? But if it was set to a 90 with this logic, all of these checks would not work and it would print grade not determined error. And I, the programmer, would know that I need to recheck my logic until I figure out what's wrong. And in this particular case, it should have been set like that. And it would have been even better just to write it as if L, lift, L, if, you know. This part is unnecessary. Should have been worded like this. If grade greater than equal to 80, print that it was a B. And then if we had done that correctly, if we had done all this, then actually just printing fail would have been a fine thing to do, right? If they didn't make an A or a B, then they could print fail and we could get rid of that. But sticking your final else in there to handle error conditions is a really, really good idea. Now, is that part of Python programming in particular? No, but it's learning to think, right, like a professional programmer understanding. I'm trying to tell you ways of avoiding problems. Because if you're going to write a lot of code, you're going to wind up putting logic errors in your code. It's not because you're a bad programmer. It's because that's the way our brains work. We're working along, and we just don't do everything perfectly. Wouldn't, so. wouldn't that last L if you, uh, else? You're right. Excellent. Excellent catch. See? That would have been flagged as a syntax error, at least. Not a logic error. You're my syntax checker. That's awesome, both of y'all. Okay, so that's cool. Thank you for fixing that. I don't even know if, if any of this stuff is syntax errors or not, right? I haven't checked it. Uh, you need colon I need to get rid of that colon. Yeah, just go ahead and run it if you're trying to run it. Fix the syntax errors, and if you can't, just comment out the entire chunk of code. And I'll show you what I mean by that, okay? I only had one problem. But what if I had a whole bunch? Right, I could make the whole th thing green just by doing that at the top of the code and coming down here and doing the same thing down here at the bottom, right, like that. You know, I could comment out the entire code if I needed to do that, if I got frustrated. It 
so I'm going to ask y'all to do that because we were doing more demonstration rather than doesn't have to be perfect. Just wanted you to see it. All right. All righty. Short circuit evaluation. I shouldn't blow that off. Who would like to get it to work and it's not working? Spot syntax errors and I'm going to miss something in there. Oh, yeah. Okay, guys. Okay, guys. You're right. If you wanted to see a print freezing and boiling and stuff, very, very good point. What if I do this? I'm going to show you a real, real, real quick demo of something. Define a function. Don't need to do this. This is going to be such a simple demo. Print. Fun. Okay. Hey, cool. I've got some code. Is it going to do anything? Nope. It didn't do anything. Why didn't it do anything? I never called the function, right? I defined it. It's like me writing down a recipe, but if I never hand you the recipe, you're not going to bake me a cake. So, whoops, I should not have closed that because I wanted to show you how to fix it. So, I should have called that function after I defined it. And that stuff that said freezing and boiling and stuff like that was all inside a function. Right? So it's not going to do any of that stuff. So what I should have done is after I defined it, I should have done check parentheses and a pass state in to trigger it. Honestly, I don't remember why I set it up like that. I think I was going to try to prove a point about making the code more reasonable. Uh, readable. If I wanted this to, uh, if I was trying to do this as a pro programmer, I like my functions to be up near the top, and so I would cut that, then take it up to the top and paste it. How do you pull from something like that? Pardon me? How do you pull from a function like that? Like, can you pull specific uh, stuff from a function? Well, if you yank something out of a function, you probably need to put it in another function. But if I, if I wanted to do this and make it look like pro code, I would move the entire function up to the top. Yeah, Jeff, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yes. Okay. There. My function's up at the top. Seeing the functions at the top, once you get a pretty uh, a little bit of experience, you can open a file. Just look at what the functions are up at the top, and you already have a good idea of what the code is dealing with, right? Here, I'd have to scroll up and down to figure out, right? Because this stuff about the freezing and the boiling was hidden down in the bottom of the code. You know, if I didn't scroll down there, I wouldn't know that it had anything to do with it. But this is relying upon values that are not set. It's relying on what what are known as global variables. Python, in this particular case, would probably let it work. Other languages won't. I should move my enums up here to the top above it, too. That's even more information, right? You open this program, and you see that, and you go, oh, I know 
what this thing's going to be working with. Now I'm happier about it. You don't have to make those changes, but the problem with the code, if you're trying to get it to run and you wanted to see those messages and you weren't, is that we didn't have that there. I guess it's pretty perfect because it doesn't need to freeze it or not. Let's set the temperature back, you know, to negative 100 degrees. It's certainly supposed to print freezing or, or turn the water up, you know, heat up or something like that. Or not. Change the wrong uh, variable. You're right. You're right. I'm just going to reset it down here. If temperature is, or just set temperature equals a negative 100 there, and now we ought to be good to go. Fix? Yeah, yeah, because it'll say freezing. And I still have my logic error there where it doesn't handle boiling. So I'm going to put a note here. Oops, I forgot to handle boiling, just to make a point. All right, anybody else? Want my eyeballs on it? All right. All right. I think I've said this before, but uh, the point of these is to make sure that you're, uh, you're typing in stuff to burn it into your brain, not that the code works. I'm not going to count you off if you turn in daily notes that don't compile. That doesn't mean that I don't want it to work, but if you feel like it, you could skip it, right? You, you could skip trying to make it work. You don't have to stay in for 30 minutes trying to type in every single detail that, uh, that I typed in here. I always upload the notes anyways. I like for, I like for people to get it to work though. You get a, a sense of you know, satisfaction out of it and you know, if you need to play with it later, you could do so. And you'd have a good code example to work with to do your homework. Just saying, it doesn't have to be perfect. I have some people who uh, just write the stuff rather than type it in. They write it on their iPad and then they then they upload the you know the notes later because they don't learn by typing; they learn by writing. Here's a good point. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it because it's more basic programming. If you took one or three, you covered it. There's something called short circuiting. What if you have this phrase? Uh, if If hungry and you have money, then go out to eat, right? What if you're not hungry? Does it even need to check this? Right? Our logic is that if you're either if you're if you're neither hungry nor you have any money, then don't go out to eat. So if hungry had been set to false then would it need to check this second part? Somebody could probably guess just based on the way I phrased the question. Somebody guess, true or false? <laughs> is it going to do this check or not if hungry is set to false? No, it shouldn't need to. It shouldn't need to, right? Because if we're not, gonna, if we're not hungry, it doesn't need to do that. That's called short-circuiting. It is The compilers optimize the code. So that if you're using AND, but the first condition is false, it doesn't even bother to do the rest. Why? Because this may be 20 expressions long. If hungry and money and near store, right, and I have a car, right, and I have gas. All of those have to be true in order for us to go out. If a single one of these is false, we're not going to go out. And so if the first one was false, why even do all these checks? Some of these checks might be expensive, right? Checking to see if we're near a store, we might have to hit Google Maps, you know, or, you know, do some calculations. Might require opening a database, finding out, you know, our, our GPS location, right? This could be a very expensive check. You don't want to do that check if something easy, like whether you were hungry or you had money, could rule it out. And when I say expensive, I mean in terms of processing, right? You had to go out to the internet. Well, going out to the internet is the thing most likely to fail. Your internet is down more than anything else. So if I was going to write this and try to make it the most optimized code possible, I would stick the most expensive one in terms of processing time down here at the end. 
in the easiest at the beginning. So, if using AND, short circuiting means that if the first condition is false, the subsequent conditions are skipped. I sh the subsequent evaluations is what I should say. But hopefully you get that. Evaluations are skipped. And so that is, in fact, called short circuiting. I'm going to put quotes around it or something to kind of flag it. Short-circuiting means that if the first condition is false. Or is a little bit different. If using or, short-circuiting, means that if the first condition is true, subsequent evals are skipped. Why is that? If sick or tired stay home. Well, if I'm sick, I don't even need to check whether I'm tired. So again, you would phrase it in terms of least expensive processing time out to most expensive. Well, how can you guess which is the least expensive and the most expensive? Well, if one of them is a function call, you know, if sick or tired, right? And you know that a function call is a, takes a little bit more time to process than just a simple Boolean variable because it's got to jump to another part of the code and then it's got to jump back. And each one of those jumps takes a little bit of time. Now, honestly, Python is not a fast enough language that you need to worry about something that's going to take two more nanoseconds because it's jumping up to a function. But if this was inside a loop that repeated 100,000 times, or x in range, you know, well, uh, right? It's going to repeat that 100,000 times. Then a one-second difference could make a lot of difference ultimately, right? That'd be, a, that'd be you know, 100,000 uh, seconds, you know, of difference if, you know, possible. If it was uh, not optimized, you might be able to improve it. If, um, you're right, if it took even a hundredth of a second more to do this check, but you had that check first. That would still be a thousand seconds more for this loop to correct. A thousand seconds, you know, that's a, a significant amount of time. It's more than ten minutes. For this class, you don't have to consider that too much. Basically, write your code first and then optimize. That's just kind of a general law of programming. Why? Because optimizing your code probably means that you're going to be making the logic a little bit more complicated. In the case of something like this, where you're just putting the, uh, the one that requires most processing last, well, that's not more complicated. But optimizing your code can make your code much more difficult to read. You're putting careful logic in there, you know, and you're putting blocking things off and if statements that used to not be in there, stuff like that. So you don't optimize your code until you find out that you're supposed to. And by that, I, I mean you know, that, you know, it tests to be too short. You always want to get the code working first, and then you start making changes to it to improve it. Because if you can't run the code, right, then uh, you don't even know where you are in the process. That's why I usually keep running the code and testing it, you know, like after every five lines I add to it, rather than, you know, waiting and uh, I type 30 minutes and then do that. And sometimes you can't always do that. And sometimes you know as you're creating this stuff that it really has to be high performance. If you're writing graphics drivers or whatever, you want it to be the highest performance and you're probably going to be thinking about optimization from the very beginning. But it still holds true. You want your graphics card to be able to draw a triangle before you spend, you know, two weeks trying to design a more efficient algorithm for displaying a polygon. All right, that's just general philosophy, not Python. But I'm trying to make y'all good programs.
programmers as well as understand how to write scripts. When you test, you need to make sure that all the possible branches or alternatives in a selection statement are exercised. Right? That thing that was supposed to print out a grade, I should check it and I want to see it print an A and a B and a C, you know, and a D and an F. Never understood why we skip D. Why do we go D to F? Also curious about what if, if you're uh, how do Russians you know grade their alphabets completely different? Do they do the same thing the first letter of the Russian alphabet? Anyways, you want to check to make sure that all of those work. Now that error that I had, where if you typed it in ninety, it would have said fail. You might not have caught that, right? You may put ninety five. Ooh, I made an A. Eighty five. Ooh, I made a B. Seventy five. I made a C. Without finding out that uh, when you typed in 90, it would fail. So, along with checking all possible branches, you want to do something called bounds checking or boundary checking. You want to check the edge cases. Edge case is a good term for it. What do I mean by that? Up here, when I had some if logic based on whether it was 90 or 80, right? This is the edge, right? That's the edge of the decision. You need to make sure it works for the edge. Now, I always waffle on whether, you know, 212 degrees means that, you know, it's turning into steam or if it has to go above 212 to turn into steam, right? And if, you know, 32 means that it's freezing or whether it has to be less than 32 to start freezing. I don't remember that. I'd have to look it up in a physics book or whatever, consult, you know, an expert in order to figure that out. But it's real easy for me to note that 90 should not print fail. And so whenever you're doing serious testing, if you have some if state and it's based on a number, make sure you test the edge cases, right? I could test 91, I could test 90, and I could test 89, right? I could check all the sides of the edge case, including being right on the edge. Make sure it works. So we're going to just add a general philosophy. Test all cases, right? All possible branches. Also, possible okay. test edge cases, like test score of 90, 80, 70, and so on, assuming that those are your edges, that those are the if statement. If something has compound Boolean expressions, like if sick or tired, right, that had two variables, test all four combinations, right? There's four different combinations if you have two Boolean variables because each one has two states, two times two is four. If you have three Boolean variables in your expression, you better test all eight cases, right? So if you have A is equal to false, B is equal to true, and the, and the stuff should be capitalized in, in, in Python, unlike most languages you have to do, you know, false and true and stuff in order to do that. And then you have some expression, if not A and B and not C, right? You have to test all possible eight combinations. You have to check false, 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 true, false, true, false, false, true, true, and then true, false, false, true, false, true, and true, true, true. true. Not that I was counting them on my fingers, but that's eight possible cases. Two to the power of three is, you know, eight. So on. the longer the expression, the more possible cases it is, the more things you have to test. Okay. Too bad. That's, that's why we're going to be making the big bucks. Let's uh, check here. Aha, the while loop. Why do we have all these conditions and stuff like that? Not just for if statements, but for while statements. Go back. Let me show you how old-time programming languages would handle looping. They use the word go to or jump, right? Say I was going to counter, write a counter that would print from 1 to 10. So C is equal to 1. That's my counter. 
print C. C plus equals 1. All right. Now, what if I didn't have a while loop and all I had was a go to or a jump? Well, in those cases, you have two, one of two things going on. You'd either have line numbers that look like this, and then you'd have some statement here that said if C less than 10, go to or jump. I don't like the fact that I'm repeating 10 twice. So I, instead, I'm going to make it count from 1 to 100. Okay, so this looks a lot like the basic language, so I'm going to use the comment for basic language, which is REM for like remark. Count from 1 to 100. So here we go. So it interests me that I see people looking at each other's screens rather than looking at me. That hurts my feelings. So anyways, this is how you loop in a language without a loop command. Now, no language anymore makes a loop command, but you see what it's doing? It sets an initial value, it does something, it changes that value, and then it repeats checking a condition, and if that condition is true, it jumps back to an earlier point. Most languages don't even have a go-to statement anymore because the code becomes almost completely impossible to follow. Right? If I had this code up, you know, I could put a, you know, a go-to, you know, line number 800, and then down at 900, I could say go to 30, and then line 40, I could say go to, you know, 220. Right? That's called spaghetti code because the go-to is leaping all over the place. It's tangled like spaghetti. So modern languages don't even support the go-to statement, and that's why they have loops. Right. This is like 1960s and 1970s style programming, and even by then, most people, most languages had go-tos. Excuse me, loops. Only stuff like assembly language, really primitive languages, had no go-tos. So nowadays, what you would do would be something like this. Here's a different way of doing that. C is equal to 1, while C is less than or equal to 100, print C, and then C plus equals 1. Again, this is not Python code. This is more pseudocode. Right? That'll do the same thing. It'll print from 1 to 100. If this is condition is true, then go ahead and do that stuff. When this condition finally becomes false, it leaves it. What about this? What if there was an even easier way? Here's how you would have written it in basic, and I want you to dump this once you see this. For C equals 1 to 100. That's how you'd write it in basic, print C. Only two statements to accomplish the same thing that four statements did. Right, start counting at one, keep going to 100. The Python would look like this. For C in range, 1 comma 101. That would count from 1 to 100. And this is important enough that I'm actually going to put it in perfect syntax. In fact, I should uh, even close our comment just to show that it works. Print C. Right. So there we go. For C in range 1 to 100, it's going to print the numbers 1 to 1. Excuse me. For C, yeah. Why did I make it 101 rather than 100? Because you have to go, you have to set this to one pass a limit. That's kind of weird, but it's just the way it does. It would be like writing this if C is less than 101. Or making this one say if C is less than 101. This range statement does not do a while C is less than or equal to 101. It just does while C is less than 101. So this is an exclusive bound. We're going to use about, uh, the math term, right? This is inclusive. 1 is inclusive. It includes 1, but it excludes 101. That's the point where it ends. So that would count from 1 to 100. That's a far better way of writing something like that, especially a far better way than using a go-to statement in a language that has it. This is the cleanest syntax. You're going to want to use for loops whenever you have the option to do so. Now, these slides are going to be talking about while loops. 
I'm hoping that while loops are so obvious that we don't need to spend a lot of time on them. They're just like if statements, except they repeat, right? Once they hit the end of the block, the condition is reevaluated. And if the condition is still true, it still it repeats the block again. Why don't I make this proper syntax to feel like getting it to work? That's how it would look. Let me prove that by running it. Yeah, yeah, that's good code. Why is this so much better? For one thing, the language may optimize this. It may construct the machine language in such a way that this runs faster. Why? Because it absolutely knows what C is going to be each time. In this case, it doesn't know what C is going to be each time. Right? It might, you know, be 10. Or it might say C is plus equal to, you know, 10, and then we might have some other statement. C, you know, is equal to, you know, calc, you know, we pass C and some other variable. Right. When it's constructing this logic, when, it, when I say it, when a compiler is turning that into machine code, it doesn't really know how C is going to be changing. In this case, it does. It knows that C is going to be counting from 1 to 100. That's it. That's all it can do. Even if we do something like this and we change it to, you know, C is equal to, you know, 100, something like that. C is equal to a million. It doesn't matter. It's going to work exactly the same. Because each time it jumps back to the top of the loop, it's just going to change C to the next one. It's like it constructs a little table ahead of time of all the values it's going to step through. So let me undo all those changes. So this code actually runs faster, believe it or not, even though the logic looks the same. And it's just easier to write because, right, it's only two lines of code rather than four. If we had, you know, a thousand lines of code, blah, 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 blah. Here's uh, my trick is to forget to update my variable whenever I'm demonstrating while loops. And then I get an infinite loop. An infinite loop is just one that repeats forever because the condition never becomes false. And so then I run it, it runs forever, and then I have to go, uh, and I have to stop it and correct it and make the change again. I don't have to do that with this one because the increment is going to happen automatically. So a signal value is one that stops it, the program from running. Enter a test score or negative one to quit. Negative one is a signal value. You're trying to mark the end of a series of data when reading a file. You might say that if it reads an FFN or an EOFN, that's where it's going to stop the loop. Well, that EOF would be a signal value. Letting the user type in, you know, do you wish to continue? Yes or no? Even that's a signal value, right? Because you have your loop based on, you know, if choice equals yes. That's a signal value. Or why don't we just call it a signal in this textbook because we want to be cool and sneak and leave off a word. So conditional iteration requires that the condition be tested while condition sequence of statements. One more mandatory thing is that the condition actually be allowed to change. Just like if I said, what if I forgot to update C in my while loop? It would be an infinite loop. If this condition never changes, then it's going to be an infinite loop. So an improper writing of it may lead to an infinite loop. And here's a phrase that I've never seen before. Go ahead and stick it in your brain if it's in the quiz, but I'm going to dump it. A while loop is also called an entry control loop. Here's a term that I've actually seen before. Pretest. A pretest loop is one that tests it before it goes into it. Other languages have a post test as well. It would look like this. This language doesn't, so you don't have to remember it. But when you go take Java, C sharp, whatever, it's called do. Do something, right? 
while, I better put this in a comment, because it's garbage, while condition, as opposed to while condition, do something. Looks the same, but it's not. Something always happens, whether the condition is true or false, right? Just by the order. That's going to happen before it's checked. So this is called a post-test loop. This is called a pre-test loop. Python only has pre-test loops. Let me uh, mark these off. assignment based on these concepts. And we're at the last, no we're not. I wish we were closer to the end. No way we're going to get through 12 slides in five minutes. A pretest loop. Check the condition. If it's true, do something. Else do something. I mean, when it finally becomes false, stop doing it. Here's the signal value. Enter a number or just enter to quit, right? And then the, they keep typing numbers in, but when they're finally tired, they type in nothing, and it creates a sum. That would be an interesting one to go ahead and enter. I hadn't thought about just making it so that you could hit enter to stop your data entry. I usually make it like negative 999 or some other impossible value. I think this would be the last thing we code today. So, you know, we're, we're going to write one of those test score average type programs. That's not quite true. I want to show you one more version of a for loop before we leave. Let's see if we can do that. But anyways, sum is equal to zero, except that's an extraordinarily bad choice of a variable name because that happens to be a function. I can tell because it changed color. So I'm going to make it total is equal to zero. And then I'm going to make one called score is equal to zero. What score? It's going to be what they type in. While score not equal to a blank, not a blank, an empty string, no space between the, code, uh, the quotes, while score not, and I'm saying not every time I see an exclamation point, exclamation equals quote, quote, <laughs> colon. We're going to ask for the score. Score is equal to input, parentheses, quote, test score, and parentheses, end quote. I better go and look at their code. I'm not liking the way this is going. Yeah, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm not going to do it their way. I'm stuck, stuck in the past. So test score or negative 999 to quit. Like that. I changed it all to 999. And then we better change that to a float. Score equals float parentheses score in parentheses. And then we can add it to the total. Total plus equals score. When they finally type in a negative 999, this condition is no longer true. And so it's going to come down here, and we can print the total. calculate an average, right? If I enter 10, 20, 30, the average should be 20. I have to type in negative 999 to quit it. Okay, I have a serious error there. What's my error? It came out to 939. That's dumb. What do I need to do 
to stop the code from having that completely erroneous data total. No. The problem is not that the data is rounded. It's dramatically off. Right. So I'm typing in numbers, and then I type in negative 999. It's including that negative 999 in my total. And I don't want it to do that. Nope, nope. What I need to do is to make sure that this doesn't happen if the score is equal to negative 999. There's two ways I could do that. I could do if score not equal, and I'm going to maybe change this, then and only then add the total. Or I could do that check up at the very top. I could come up here and do score, excuse me, total plus equals score right there rather than doing it here. Honestly, I like reading it like this better. That makes more sense to my brain. But you better only do one or the other. A lot of textbooks will show it like this. And as a matter of fact, they even ask for the first input up here. But you don't need to do that in this particular case because we initialize that variable to zero. I don't know which to go with. That or that. I think I would normally do it like that. So does that make sense? Negative 999 is our signal value. We ask for the input, convert it to a float. If that score is not equal to 999, then we add it to score. The fact that we have an if statement in here means that we have some flexibility in how to handle it. What if we want to let them type in Q to quit? Nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to leave it alone. All right, I hope that loop makes sense. Um, and certainly we're going to hit that again. They showed us a different variation of it. I'm not going to even go and look at that variation of it. Remember, you're supposed to be reading the text in the PowerPoints, too. I don't have to say everything that's in the PowerPoints. Yes, sir? Doesn't the bottom 999 need to be negative as well? Oh, yes, indeed. Thank you all. I wouldn't have spotted that until I tested it. You rock. Okay. So, homework. I don't ask y'all if, if uh, y'all have questions or not. Whenever my uh, boss evaluates me, he says I ought to be calling on people. You know, George, what do you think? You know, and what do you, I, I don't like doing that, but I should pause momentarily and ask if there are questions. Thank y'all for jumping in when there's a mistake. I appreciate it. Y'all become my favorite students. All right, so our homework. What we're going to do is write a program that lets the user choose an action of whether to say, you know, bonjour, hello, how do you, or hola. Let them type in one, two, or three to make that decision. Now, I'm not telling you whether bonjour is supposed to be a one or two or three, right? Uh, so, write a loop. It could either be a while loop or for loop. We have examples of both that will count from 20 to 40. And then write code that will ask the user if they are happy at, that will ask the user for a number and will keep looping as long as they enter a 1. Right, so while the number is equal to 1. That's a, an awful lot like our sum code, ex, our total code, except it's not calculating a, t a total. I'm being more vague in these descriptions. What that means is that I'm 
expecting you to think harder about it. And it also means that if you get stuck, I'm going to jump in and help you write. And lastly, if you've uh, worked on it over the weekend and you ask questions on Tuesday, you're going to have you know ample time to get it done by Thursday. And I always give you a day's grace period anyway, so if you had to ask questions on Thursday. But it's always a good idea to work on stuff over the weekend if you possibly can. Now, this may be really, really easy stuff, and that's totally cool for the people who are learning you know, Python for the very first time because you didn't you know, have a class that taught it before. might be a little bit more struggle. That's okay. Take a shot at it. If it's hard, ask me for help, text, whatever. Now I'll ask. That makes sense, guys. Are we good to go? I see thumbs up. I see a lot of blank faces. No, I'm kidding. Thank you all for responding. I'll bring the uh, thing back up, and as always, I'll post it. By the way, if you get here, you look at the assignments page, and uh, you notice that one of the homework doesn't have an assignment link underneath it, you can always find that homework in the homework folder. If you can't find it there, it's at the end of the daily notes. Now I, now I hopefully have it all properly set up. But if, yeah. but if you don't, then just go ahead and grab it out of the homework and please send me a text so I can correct it to make it correct for everybody else. Alright guys, there's a Dropbox there. Please to upload notes or something saying you are here. <laughs>